welcome to the first in a series, a continuing series of true crime. I'm Juliana and this is Barbara and we bring to you today uh, true crime, finding closure. And you might want to know uh, by asking yourselves why? Well, we're doing this because over in this, in this country and across the world there are thousands of uh, unresolved cold cases of, of both missing people and homicides and amongst others that uh, don't get media attention or don't get enough media attention and are uh, cold or unresolved and you're just kind of hanging out there waiting for a tip or something to come in to give the police and other authorities the direction in which to go. So today we decided, you know, as a duo here to start telling some of these stories that are not uh, talked about a lot and get them out into the public, out into the media and hopefully... Hopefully, 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 someone sees something and and knows something. You know, even the most obvious thing that might be the answer, and you might be like, "Oh, I was there. I didn't know what was going on, but I was there. <laughs> I saw something." You know, who knows? So we're hoping that this will, you know, bring closure to some families and bring hope to some families that people are out there still trying to tell their stories and to to bring their loved ones home. Um, you know, I was uh, to a little bit know a little bit more about me. I was born in Colorado and raised in Colorado and Kansas, and so I have the experience of rural life and city life. Um, I also, you know, over the years observed behavior in my family. So, Eric, if you're watching, thank you for being my muse. But uh, I studied behavior, and you know, would stare off and stare at people, not realizing exactly what I was doing. Um, but then ended up going to school for it. I got a bachelor's degree in psychology and then continued my education. And, uh, you know, I have studied behavior and, you know, it's become a part of me, but I didn't go um, looking at criminal cases. I was just looking at behavior and behavior in general until I lost a dear friend to suicide in 2003. And I was left with the woulda, coulda, shouldas and if onlys. And it taught me a lot about him and a lot about me and I realized I wanted to help these families out there who had missing people in their life or people who had been uh, murdered or whatnot and I wanted to be able to uh, help them find closure help them find answers answers that I will never have um, so that's why I do this this is why I wanted to do this show and hopefully get these stories out there and get the, these people's stories told and and whatnot, and I'm bringing my friend Barb here along for the ride. Barb, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I was born and raised in a little town uh, in Southern California, uh, Azusa, and uh, worked in L.A. till I uh, joined the Air Force, uh, tech school in Biloxi and, and uh, Lowry, Colorado, and spent a couple of years in England uh, with some jaunts over to Germany and uh, met my future ex-husband. He had this assignment I followed on, like Austin, back in the good old days of uh, uh, Spamorama and stuff. Years later, we met, and she were tell, talking about her interest in these this type of cases, and when we were just comparing things, we gelled in, in figuring out things. Uh, her schooling and my thinking outside the box age we don't want to talk about but years of experience years of life different perspective and it worked so that's how we started doing stuff like this um and it's and it's fun it's neat the whole process but uh uh so this is fascinating so which brings here. us to this next step of doing media so you get more people involved in some of these cases and get the stories out and say, hey, you know, maybe you might know something. In the words of Robert Stack, it might be you. <laughs> so, you know, hey, if you know any of these cases that we do, we're going to uh, post them every other week on Wednesdays, uh, 10 Pacific Standard Time. They'll be posted on there. So please like, subscribe, and comment, and hit the little bell to get notified when the posts are up. And any case that we do, uh, if you do have any uh, knowledge, information, tips, etc., etc., the number of the K of the 
police or the criminal case unit or whoever is involved uh, in handling the case for wherever state or whatever uh, county will be posted in the description down below. So click on that. Call that number. You can do it anonymously. You know, some of these cases, just, you know, one tip can be the answer to solve it all. You know, you might have seen something and not realize what you've seen. And, oh, that, 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 you know, person walking down the street, a color of a car, you know. Who knows? So if you do have any answers to any of the cases that we present, please, you know, contact them and you know they'll be happy to take your phone calls and take your information and every tip is investigated. So please do that if you can. Um, but again, we're here to bring these stories to you. Uh, we're going to have a bunch of them. This is going to be an ongoing series and we're going to go take it as long as we can take it. And hopefully in the greatest things of the world, bring people home. That's what our, and bring finding closure <laughs> for all the families out there. So uh, the first case we are bringing to you today is one out of New Hampshire. It is considered the Holy Grail of Holy Grails of missing person cases. And it's because it is so immense. It's huge. I mean, there's so much detail and so much information and so many paths, paths and deceptions. And it's you're going every which way and it's it gets daunting a little bit after a while and stuff and this case you know if you have peacock at home there's a six-part documentary on peacock that is phenomenal to watch very good it's very very good uh, there's a u.s marshal by the name of art that's a part of it and maggie uh curly or fringling excuse me who is the one that actually is presenting the, the documentary, as along with uh, another gentleman named James Renner, who actually wrote this book. It's called True Crime Addict. Uh, it's How I Lost Myself in the Mysterious Disappearance of Mara Murray. It's all about his experience from the Mara Murray case and how he got lost in it. And the, this case. This is the case that we're going to be working to tell you about here. You know, it's his, his story. It's an excellent book. You know, it gives a perspective on this story that is just, wow, you know, it puts pieces together and it, it was kind of a little freaky for me because I had a theory that I had uh, talked to myself when I was looking at this case and as I was reading this book lo and behold he had the exact same theory almost worded and verbatim in here uh, that I had so it is a really good book you can get this at you know Barnes and Noble or any other book dealer so definitely definitely something good to read if you find uh, true crime interesting he has a couple other books out there he's published on so um, not true crime but uh he also, you know, did his documentary, um, and there was the disappeared uh, documentary on investigative discovery about it, and then of course the six part one on Peacock, um, all of which are really good. <clears throat> they go into description about what happened, who she was, who she is, and the the case in general. So, you know, if you find this interesting, what we talk about interesting, and you want more information about Mara, I would really highly recommend uh, look at the, look up these cases. You know, it's, 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 and it's exciting. So on to Mara. Now, Mara was born in Massachusetts, in Hanson, Massachusetts, on May 4th, 1982. Uh, she was the daughter, or is the daughter, I can't say was, but was or is the daughter of Fred and Laura Murray. Uh, Fred was a nuclear medicine technician, and Laura was a nurse. They had uh, five children. Mara was the fourth of five. Uh, Freddie Jr., Kathleen, Julie, Mara, and Kirk. Kurt, excuse me. Uh, Mara loved to hike. She loved the color blue. She loved fresh fruit. She loved coffee. She loved chocolate. She was a normal, normal girl growing up. Um, and sadly enough, when she was six years old, her parents divorced. Her father moved about an hour or so away, but we did continue to come down daily uh, to train with the girls. They were both, uh, he trained them and was very strict and controlling it in some ways uh, in athletics and academics. You know, he pushed them to <clears throat> excel, excel in, the, in both of these. And uh, for those of you who don't live in this country, you know, we get, you know, when you excel at academics and um, athletics, you can get scholarships. And a lot of times scholarships will help people, especially for in poor communities, to pay for school. And it was known that they were a low-class family. They didn't have a lot of money. Mara was seen uh, going door-to-door, -door, uh, selling stuff to earn money and stuff. But for the most part, she was a normal girl. She was just as comfortable in track gear as she was in a prom dress. You know, she was the high school star runner. She was a point guard on the basketball team. You know, 
she even scored 1420 on her her uh, what you call it her uh, SATs, which is considered a perfect score almost, I think, or is a perfect score I think. Um, incredibly smart, incredibly talented young lady. Uh, she was on her roll. She graduated, and then was accepted to one of the most prestigious military colleges in this country. Uh, is, would we consider college or university? It's West Point. It's a standalone. Uh, school, West Point, uh, which is an Army military school, and it is extremely pre prestigious. And then, you know, it's you have to have a higher person to basically sponsor you into the school. And in her case, it was Senator Ted Kennedy, which is incredible that he did that. He, she got in. She followed her sister, who was there a year earlier. So they were both Murray girls were going to school at West Point. And, you know, that's also where she met her boyfriend, Bill Roush, um, who was a junior at West Point, and they apparently had fallen in love and were dating, and it was all very pretty much normal. Um, you know, nobody could say an unkind thing about Mara. She was pictured as the perfect, innocent, sweet, bubbly, fun-loving, caring um, individual. She was awesome. You know, apparently she had, you know, so that makes, makes that her, Mara's behavior and actions in the four days before she disappeared to be, stick out more because she was such a sweet and diligent and hardworking individual. She had no enemies that we knew of, you know. She uh, was at West Point, was about three semesters into West Point. Uh, she went to Fort Knox on a trip with some of her classmates and went into the commissary, which is the military version of a grocery store, and ended up stealing or shoplifting $5 worth of merchandise, which was like a, a thing of lipstick and a bottle of nail polish. She was ended up being apprehended by the MPs, which is military police. And because it was such a small and significant amount and they were able to recover the merchandise, they didn't charge and, her with anything. Yeah, but And with her academic record... They, she was, didn't normally get in any Yeah, control. she was, first offense, seemed like a good, good girl, could have been an accident. They kind of just did like a little slap on the hand, you know, you can go. However, because she was at West Point, and because of the prestigiousness of West... Standards are higher. The standards are higher, and it's like three strikes, you're out, kind of thing. And this must have been her third strike. There are reports that Mara had been found passed out drunk oh, in the hallways mm -hmm. of West Point, which had been strike one, strike two, and then, of course, strike three now, doing the, the shoplifting. So, you know, w whether it was to get out of West Point on purpose, because towards the end of her time there, it was seen by her former coaches in high school and people she knew that she seemed unhappy at being at West Stressed. Point. Stressed. Stressed. Because it's a... It's not like your normal college. No, you get up at four thirty in the morning. Yeah. You've got KP duty, which is kitchen patrol and bathroom patrol and calisthenics. Military, and it's latrine. <laughs> huh? Military, well, it's latrine. Latrine. <laughs> <laughs> latrine duty. You know, you had all these things, and you know you you were from the time you got up at four thirty in the morning to the time you laid your pillow, your head on your pillow at night. You were on the go. You had. A very strict schedule and regime that you had to to meet, and it didn't leave room for anything fun. It wasn't the fun college life that you normally hear about. You know, it was, we're going to go, we're going to do this, we're going to, you know. So, yeah. it was it was difficult, you know, for her. And I, I, I think it would be difficult for any college student, really. And it is, not many people make it through West Point. Only a few do at a time, because it is so so prestigious um leaving there um whether it was you know for rebellious reasons or whatever she did get into another prestigious uh program at the university of mass massachusetts uh nursing program where she seemed to be happy and was excelling and she was there for three years and she just seemed to be the mar that everybody knew i mean she was happy she was in love with her boyfriend she had friends she was the track team you know she was doing Everything that you normally do as a college student. She was enjoying her, what appeared to be enjoying her life. And, or at least that we thought, <laughs> anyways. Uh, in November of 2003, um, 
really before that, around October, September, October, Laura's de Maura's demeanor changed. She became withdrawn, evasive, pensive in some ways, I guess, just not her normal outgoing bubbly self. She wanted, she was not the normal Laura, uh, Mara that everybody knew and loved. Um, why it was causing that, we don't know. We have speculations, but we don't really know what was causing the drastic change in behavior. Uh, November of 2003, the Amherst police received a phone call from a student in Kennedy Hall, or we would later find out to be Kennedy Hall, that her credit card had been used to purchase about $85 worth of pizza, sub sandwiches, things like that. So the police actually contacted all the restaurants and contacted you know, them and said, hey, if you get another phone call and they're going to you know, use this credit card, let us know and we're going to track it down. So again, that card was used and when they tracked it, they followed the delivery guide and went to Kennedy Hall and it was Mara who came down to sign for it. Now, how she got the credit card number is up for debate. Uh, she said, I don't know why I did it. I don't know where I got it. There was never really a, a defined explanation as to how she got the credit card number. But she did use it, and she was held uh, charged with uh, in, uh, inappropriate use of a credit card. In those days, the whole credit card number was on a receipt, so she could have found a receipt. And, and know, used it. Yeah. And used it. Used the information. Um, but she was charged with that, which is about $500 fine and about a year in prison. So she went to court on December the 16th, and the judge threw out the charge and said, hey, you keep your nose clean, and we'll just go ahead and expunge this from your record. And she, they did that because her academics are so good. She seemed like a, you know, a, a healthy, happy student, you know, one little blunder. It wasn't that big. It was under $100. It was not relatively minor. So... She went on, we had Christmas, you know, she had Thanksgiving, holidays went by fine. January, she started back up at school again, and which brings us to February of 2004, when everything seemed to has changed. Um, February 5th, 2004, which was the Thursday before she disappeared, uh, Mara was a few hours into her job at Melville uh, Hall, which was a dorm, and around 10 p.m., Mara received a phone call on her cell phone from her sister, uh, Kathleen. What that phone call entails, we do not know. We do know that Kathleen has stated that it was just sisters talking. She has also stated that it was her telling Mara that she is out of rehab, but she has fallen off the wagon again. Not anything more than that has been told. But... Um, after that phone call, she was seen again at around about 1 a.m. at the desk at her job, catatonic, in a catatonic state. Uh, you could wave your hand in front of your, her face. She didn't respond. She wasn't responding to anybody. She wasn't checking IDs like she was supposed to. She just was there. Her manager, Kathleen, or not Kathleen, <laughs> her manager, um, Karen Mayote, got word that something was wrong with her and went down to check her. And tried to communicate with her, but she just kind of sniffled and stared straight on and not really moved. Mm -hmm. And kept saying over and over again, my sister, my sister, my sister. What that means, I don't know. <clears throat> There's, again, speculation. Um, but it was so bad that she had to log Mar out of the, the computer systems and the logs and stuff. And... Uh, escort her back to her dorm at Kennedy Hall, which was right across the way, and told Mara, you, you might want to get some, you know, medical help, you know, mental health help. You know, you're having some issues, it appears, you know, nothing wrong with that. And Mara just kind of nodded her head and proceeded into her dorm. Uh, it would be four days, it would be, excuse me, be around the 17th of February when Karen found out that Mara was missing when the Amherst police contacted her. She did file the report with them, but they never responded back to her. But, uh, yeah, she was just completely... That was the first big red flag. That was basically the first flag was that night, that phone call, that behavior. That was the first flag in a long, long, long line of flags. <laughs> yeah. um, 
so let me fast forward to Saturday, February the 7th. Uh, Mara's father, Fred Murray, came down or came over to Amherst, you know, to buy a car, help Mara buy her car because her 96, 1996 Saturn was on its last lap. It was having issues, it was smoking, a cylinder was slipping, and they both had agreed that it was time for Mara to get a new car. So he came to Amherst, but on his way, he stopped and he pulled $4,000 out of his bank account from various, uh, ATMs, and proceeded to join Mara and they did apparently spend the day on that Saturday shopping for a vehicle and they actually didn't buy one and then that evening Fred took Mara and her friend Katie how did you say that name Mark Markopoulos 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 M-A-R-K-O-P-O-U-L-O-S yeah, um, out for dinner to a local brew pub and seemed to have a good time. And then about 10 o'clock that night, they drop Fred off at his hotel room on the way back to their dorm to for a party. Uh, but before they were dropped off, they actually stopped with Fred to buy some alcohol for that party. And then to proceeded to drop Fred off and return to their dorm. Uh, in Fred's car. In Fred's car. Uh, to the party, which was right down, like five or six doors, apparently down from where Mara's dorm was. Um but they were there. What happened at that party is another red flag. We don't know if it was a farewell party or what was going on, but something happened at that party, presumably, um, that caused even more stuff because she left, would be leaving shortly after that. And um, yeah. But the fact that her two friends, Kate and Sarah Alfarini, A L F R E R I, um, and Sarah's dorm was the one where the party was being held. And, you know, they were all there. And none of them, neither one of them would talk about the, the party. And neither one of them would, it was very, very mum about it. They didn't claim they didn't remember who was there. Exactly. They didn't, who was there or, you know, very, you know, hush-hush about it. It was not explained, wasn't told. Right. You know, it was nothing. So it leaves... A question mark as to what happened at that party, you know, to to cause that. But we do know that uh, Kate left the party about two thirty in the morning uh, with another gentleman or guy and went to wherever they did, wherever they were going. And Mara ended up leaving around three thirty in the morning, which is another flag, which was kind of odd. Uh, here she was, just a few doors down from her dorm room, but yet she leaves at three thirty in the morning. To take to travel back to her father's hotel to return the car at three thirty in the morning, and on the way she crashed into a guardrail, and caused about ten thousand dollars worth of damage to her father's car, brand new car. Brand new car. And the police arrived to the scene. A tow truck driver arrived to the scene. They took, you know, they towed her father's car away, and it surprises me that they didn't give her a you know, arrest her or give her a ticket for a DUI because she was presumably intoxicated from the drinking she had at dinner and the drinking that she would presumably had at the party. It would stand to believe why, you know, otherwise, why would she crash into the car? Why would she take her father's car back at 3.30 in the morning? He wasn't going to need it until the next day. She could have gone home, slept it off, and gone in the morning and <clears throat> avoided the accident altogether. Exactly. It's just, that's just why. You know, those, those really those questions and they're why, 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 yeah, and why. But the uh, tow truck driver brought her back to her dad's hotel, and which is there's a bunch of questions and speculations about that because of how Fred had said in one interview, oh she uh, came in the the front desk, called me down, I got her. Another one, he said that she was already there, she had a key or something, and let herself into the room, and he didn't know she was there until the next morning. I don't know about you, Barb. But if somebody is entering my hotel room, I'm yeah. sure he's going to hell and going to know about it. Yeah. You know, so I don't buy the, oh, I didn't know she was there until the next morning. Because yeah. unless you're a dead to the world sleeper, you're going to know when somebody enters your hotel room. Those doors aren't light, you know, yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so what happened in that hotel room, what she was doing, we don't know. But we know that the next morning, Mara uh, helped Fred get a rental car, and then Fred proceeded to uh, drop Mara off at her dorm, yeah. which would be the last time he would see her. Um, 
you know, he would go off to Connecticut where he was working. She went to her dorm room, and from all appearances, it appeared that she was studying and doing normal things, but it appeared that she had packed up her entire dorm room, took all the posters off the wall, packed all the blankets, the pillows, all her knickknacks and things, and packed them away. Mm. And um, printed out, uh, you know, getting ready to to leave. And the next day, which was Monday the 9th of February, the day she disappeared, uh, she printed on her personal computer, she printed out a MapQuest. And for those of you who don't know what MapQuest is, it's the archaic version of GPS. <laughs> it's, uh, you print out directions and a map of who, what, when, where, and why. And it takes you where you need to go. And uh, But you don't have a nice little voice telling you which way to turn. It's all paper. Uh, but she printed out directions to Stowe, Vermont, and Bartlett, Vermont, or North, or North New Hampshire, which is right on the border of mm. Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, she also did a search for rental properties and hotel rooms and places that she'd been before with her dad and with her family because they would go camping, hiking a lot up there. So she was trying to find a place, to find a place to stay. I mean, this all could have been a red herring. We don't know. But that's what it looks like she was doing. Uh, she then emailed her professors and her boss, both bosses, saying that there was a death in the family and that she'd be gone for about a week and then she would return. Um, so she, you know, explained that she would be gone for about a week and stuff like that. So uh, she did that. She also returned a uh, lab coat and scrubs to a classmate by hanging it on the door. And she was like, she did all this, you know, and she packed her. Her uh, stuff was all packed up, and the letter that was laid upon uh, the top of the pile was an email from her boyfriend admitting that was the other part of it. Things started to go down a little bit even more for her because her boyfriend, uh, Billy, had admitted to cheating on her. Her friends didn't like him either. We were always trying to find ways of breaking them up. They're like, oh, we, you, know, they, you deserve so much better, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they got some really creepy vibes from him and they, when they met him. And tried to talk her uh, out of seeing him so but yeah the but boxing up all of her stuff and just leaving it there with that letter on top is that was that supposed to explain why she needed to get away for the locals she had to tell the officials that it was a death in the family because she couldn't just take time off but that's now it could have been her friends packing it up after she left because they mm -hmm. wouldn't uh, discover her uh, cleaned up dorm room until a few days after she disappeared. So yeah. it could very well have been her friends. She didn't have a roommate. She was. She didn't have a roommate. Herself. Her friends, Kate and Sarah, packing it up. We don't know for sure. I mean, it's never been just a, a theory or a thought. Um, but uh, about three forty p.m. on that same day, February 9th, Mara went to the ATM and pulls out two hundred and eighty dollars from the local ATM, emptying her account. She was next seen at a local convenience, excuse me, liquor store, buying an obscene amount of alcohol. And I'm talking... For one person. For one person. Like liquor, it was um, vodka and a box of wine and Kahlua and basically the fixings for a white Russian um, and a box of wine and a bunch of alcohol. Way too much for a single individual. I mean, just, it was enough to probably give at least a dozen people a drink or two. I mean, yeah. it was a lot of alcohol. So, but she got her alcohol, and then she got in her car and got on to Interstate 91 and headed north. And about three and a half hours later, Mara crashed her Saturn, 96 Saturn into a snowbank on the wild Amon Sudic Road in Havenville, New Hampshire. Which is where the really story begins. <laughs> Uh, she crashed it at 7.27 p.m. Um, it was, the first person to call in there was Faith Westman. She actually heard the car crash and was right across the street from where the accident uh, happened. So she's like peeking through her window, you know, look, you know, yeah, that is, yeah. you know, Barb. You know, peeking through your window. Yeah. Uh, you know. Kravitz. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh. It was it. It was just it was enough to trigger the airbag and crash into the snowbank, and uh, so it's not not like in a tree or anything like that. It, she was uh, windshield damage, 
but she was out and disoriented, but not uh, probably because of the alcohol that she'd had. But uh, it was a, um, but the airbags worked, so she damaged the car, but she couldn't drive it. But the airbags were deployed, like you were saying, and there's a crack in the driver's side of the windshield. There was also what appeared to be like red liquid or stains on the door uh, when the police had responded to it. And they automatically assumed it was a drunk driver that had was, crashed into the snowbank and took off, not wanting to get a DUI and will appear the next day or the next couple of days yeah. to pick up their car. It was very a common experience up there. Um, so they didn't think anything of it. Um, but... Like I said, the accident happened at 7.27 p.m. Um, Faith Westman is the one that call, initially called 911. About 7.30, Butch Atwood, who was a local school, school bus driver, pulled up. It was just getting off his shift, and he was coming home. He arrived, and he saw Mara there and opened the door and was talking to her for a couple minutes, asking if she was okay and if she needed any help or needed them to call the police or anything like that. And she said, no, I'm, I called AAA, which Bush knew was a lie because there's absolutely no cell service up there in that particular area of the country. No. None whatsoever. So Bush said, okay, if you need me, I'm going to be over there like 100 yards away at his home. So he pulled into his home, back, you know, he backed into his home and went inside real quick like, about 7.40, uh, he told his, his wife, Barbara, to call the local authorities and call 911. And he went back out to his car to do paperwork and keep an eye on Mara. And so the, when his wife called 7.40, he was busy. 911 called back at 7.43. And then 7.46 is when Cecil Smith, the local police officer, showed up at the scene. And the car was locked. Airbags had been deployed. And Mara was gone. So, all in toll, you know, between the time this whole takes place, about 15 minutes is the whole time. But when eyes weren't upon her, was no more than, about than five. five minutes. I mean, literally. I mean, it was literally, there's not a lot of time to disappear. There was um, also a guy across the street from Butch who uh, yeah, was just, could, see, mm -hmm. could see the accident. So, he, was, he had been watching too. Uh, John Marriott. Yeah across the street so he saw you know everything going on there you know and, yeah so to them it was just a you know a, a normal event where the cop showed up he looked around there, oh it was a crack in the windshield there's red wine that was a drunk driver will hit towed and you know whatnot so when mike lebois lebois uh was asked by jeffrey williams and cecil smith to tow her car Instead of towing it directly to like an impound lot or into a, a, a garage, they had him tow it to his own personal garage and put it under lock and key until they could get it to F Troop, which was a local police department, to hold on to it until something happened. So, but uh, yeah, it was, I think it was just really odd that they had him do that. It was kind yeah. of an odd thing. But at the same time, this is a small community, a remote area, so they may not have had a, a garage nearby. They could probably may have not been able hold of somebody or maybe they didn't uh and because they thought it was just somebody who was walking off you know and just put it somewhere safe but not process it exactly and uh, because it, it just seemed to be somebody will come and get it because they're not too far from a ski area ski resort so they probably have tourists that come through and rather than have all that yeah like sober up they'll come and get the car and they move along yeah. You know, at the same time, police attempted to contact Fred, who was the registered uh, registered owner of the vehicle, but couldn't get a hold of him because he, they only had his home number. So it was left on his home machine, and he wasn't there. He was actually in Connecticut, where he was working at the time. And it wasn't until a couple of days later when Kathleen got the message and then related to Fred, who then contacted uh, Haverhill Police Department. Um, and after they were contacted on that Wednesday, 36 hours later, they realized, uh-oh, we have a problem. We have a missing person. This is not just a normal drunk driving accident. Mm -hmm. This is a missing person. Uh, Fred, and that's when Fred Murray and the family started coming up there. Friends, family, everybody converged on Haverhill trying to, to locate Murray and start doing searches. A bolo was uh, 
It was announced at 12.36 p.m. that Wednesday, and Ebola stands for Be on the Lookout for Someone Matching Mara's Description that maybe she's out walking, she may have bumped her head because the windshield was cracked, she could have amnesia. We don't know, but uh, they started doing a search and stuff, uh, trying to find her. Um, around the same time, the detectives, the detectives had learned what she had told her professors and that it was not true, yeah. that there was no death in the family. So that kind of gave a flag as to, okay, why is she leaving? Why was she in New Hampshire to begin with? And what happened to her after she crashed her car? And also back at the scene, at the crash, they didn't... There, had been fresh snow on the ground. There hadn't been any more snow. So that they, when they looked, there were no tracks leading into the, into the woods that were right next to where she was. So she hadn't wandered off into there, and um, and nobody had seen her. Leave later on with and later on with the when they had the, the, uh, the sniffer dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, the they did. They tracked her walking about what three hundred about three hundred yards no about a hundred yards about a hundred yards from the feet. car, and the scent went cold like, as though she got into a car, which nobody had seen any headlights or a car come by, so it's more mysteries. So, but, but like in the 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 uh, map quest on the thing it showed her going up ninety one to you know, the northwest, which is the Vermont and northern part of New Hampshire. But where the car accident was, was to the northeast, which was like 60, 70 miles off of where she should have been. Yeah. And she knows that way, and where she printed out the map quest, that's that area that she had grown up going camping with her family or with her dad. And so she knows that area. And as an adult, she would it's not like she would have taken a wrong turn and go, ended up in this other place. That was That's why we think it's a... A red herring. Yeah. I think that's I mean, where the stuff in going. the car was all the normal stuff that you, that a normal person, kid, teenage kid, with your college kid would take. Your textbooks, clothes for about five or six days, you know, toiletries, and you know, she had some of her jewelry there, birth control pills, teeth whitener, toothbrush, toothpaste. I mean, normal stuff that you'd see when you're going on a trip somewhere. Yeah, and nothing out of the normal. You know, she the things that were missing were her cell phone and her backpack, which we all assume that. But with Mara, wherever Mara went, um, you know, there was they the already started questioning people, you know, Sarah and Kate, who were the last two to see her, um, outside of the people in that corner, you know, and at first they were very open and forthgiving with information, and then when Fred got involved, Fred Murray, that is Mara's dad, um, all communication between friends and family kind of stopped which is extremely unheard of in a missing person case or any uh, missing person murder case because normally families want as much media as they can possibly get trying get to get out. their story out, their word out, saying, hey, my daughter, my son, whoever is missing, you better look out, look for them, find them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for them to close off as much as they did and say, no, nope, we don't want any media, we don't want this, we don't, you, don't know, you don't need to know about her past. Another red flag. You know, <laughs> is suspicious you know yeah. it's like okay you are you hiding something that you don't want us to know about her past because it just seemed too out there i guess you could say and so <laughs> focused on well she's missing now let's count just the missing but that's not normal you look into the last six months or mm -hmm. four months of somebody's life to see if there were any changes that could yeah any Pretty good uh, police investigation, we look six months out, you know, six yeah. months into the past, you know, prior to the disappearance of the murder to find out, okay, you know, we talked to, they talked to everybody. They talked to your postman. They'll talk to your friends, your family, your moms, dads, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, yeah. best friends, coworkers, anybody and everybody that you may have come in contact with. They will contact them and say, did you see anything strange? Any abnormal behavior? Did she talk to somebody that you knew? Did she mention a new boyfriend? You know, with the chat stuff back then you know she could have met somebody on chat and they were you know scheduling to meet up somewhere and it turned out to be a not nice person who knows there are many different uh, options and theories that this could have happened so it's some of the people they would really like to talk to or the people who were at that party mm -hmm. that the night before she went left, so again if any of you guys were at that party please come forward and say something you know i know kate and sarah they don't want to talk about it 
But, you know, anybody else that was there, if you know anything about it, please come forward because that could be the, ultimately the answer of solving this crime and bringing you more home. I mean, it really, something as simple as that. So please, 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 please bring, uh, come forward if you have any information. Um, you know, the family, again, turning down all the media, you know, James Renner well, wrote this book and at first, you know, Fred didn't want that written. Fred didn't want anything remotely done and then they, they had to get permission to do the six-part documentary which is remarkable to me that they agreed to doing that because they were turning away everything and to the point where fred murray actually sued new hampshire for not doing the new hampshire state police and the in the state itself for not doing enough in finding mara and i'm like they did it quite a bit and a mm -hmm. lot of it you know they couldn't you know complete because, because fred. fred putting walls up everywhere you know, I mean, it was just, okay, <laughs> you know, why are you doing this? Why, <clears throat> when you're trying to find your loved one, why are you hiding it all? Why not let people talk about it? You know, when Kathleen was interviewed and stuff, you know, Kathleen was like, oh, it's just a phone call. I just talk to my sister, whatever. You know, and then she finally admitted that she mentioned to her sister she was getting out of rehab and fell off the wagon, and that's what she told her sister about. I have my doubts because her becoming catatonic, like so many witnesses have seen, having your sibling go off the wagon like that isn't enough to cause that. She, Worried, yes. You know, uh, fretting about it, but catatonic? No. No. Um, when they started doing the searches and stuff, they found on her computer uh, that she possibly might have been pregnant because she was looking up what pregnant what uh, alcohol can do to a pregnancy and to the baby and she looked up a lot of sites and a lot of information more so than you would think because yes she was in clinicals yes she was starting to become a nurse and yes they were doing the, the maternity segment but because of the vast majority of what she was looking up and how much she looked up it was appeared to be more than um, than academic than academic so if she was pregnant you know, there were rumors that she was becoming promiscuous and things like that. Um, one of her, her assistant coach actually came forward and said that he had had sexual relations with her, along with varying members of the track team. Um, whether whether that's fully true, we don't know. But if she was doing that, she did get pregnant, or she got pregnant by Billy. And there's even speculation that she may have gotten pregnant by Fred Murray, her dad, because of the closeness and unusual bond, or unusual closeness that they had. Mm -hmm clingy you know it was you know a thought to be that i'm wondering if kathleen may have been abused by her dad too and that's what was revealed in that phone call to mara was that i was abused too when mara may have said to her that hey, i'm pregnant and dad's the culprit or if she didn't know who it was and started you know then maybe in the discussion finally mentioned it might be dad because yeah. I can't imagine her just calling up and saying, yeah, I'm pregnant, but it, and it's dad's. Yeah. Even if it was. And, it would be. I'm just saying, somehow in yeah, the conversation, it, be, it got to that, you know, about the, it Yeah, it got dad. to the emotional that, that, her, that Kathleen admitted falling off the wagon. She's drinking again. Why are you doing that? And then, and then somehow they finally yeah, met. Because a lot of times that. when people drink to excess and do drugs to excess, it's to forget something that has transpired them. Some event or something. Some trauma. Some trauma that they're trying to forget. And considering that she had been doing this for a considerable amount of time, mm -hmm. it leads to believe, and then the unusual behavior of Fred, not wanting to know about, not wanting the world to know about Mara's past, leads to an idea that maybe there was more to what happened between her and him than he wants to be out yeah. in the public. And I can understand that if you did do that to your daughter, it's the last thing I want the world to know. But it's also impeding the investigation. But also Mara being, if if this was was the case, if she was being abused, she says, oh, you know, the, it's happening to her. But when she, if they, the discussion with her sister that she had been abused before, then she's, oh no, it's not just me. And then that may the, resemble the my sister comment. Yeah, that that could be the catatonic. Yeah. That could do that. You know, also, you know, Barb does a, a lot of times for me has gone done 
the map things and has actually followed the, the path on a lot of things. That Google we Maps through. Street View, get down there and, t and just, just travel along the same route. And I was doing screenshots of um, possible places, landmarks to, you know, okay, here's a convenience store, here's that. And, but the weird, uh, complicated route that when you get off 91 and you ultimately get on 302, and then when it goes through town, it does some weird stuff to go through. Then it finally continues on. But that it, it's not. If she had been drinking while she was driving on this, it would be easy to miss any one of those turns because you had to do some jogging to get back on 302 and then get ultimately to 112, which is where she ended up. Um, and But going along there seeing the signs and I thought that the full daylight is hard to it's hard to catch where mm -hmm. it was going but at night you know that's I'm where the, snowy, the next theory snowy and icy yeah temperatures and i'm looking at dark. it at daytime and sunny and, and everything it's dark and dark 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 rural remote area yeah no destination in mind you know i mean the far you have to go at least you know 60 miles to get to the ski lodge that's yeah. up there but there's no real destination where she was going. There's no cell service. There was no reason for her to be on that road. Yeah. Um, but uh, and the, the tree line, the trees are so dense. I mean, the police officers were liking it to Mirkwood from uh, the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings movie. Uh, that thick, dense trees and stuff like that. And for those of you who don't know, up in the mountains and stuff, when you're... The road may be, you know, clean and stuff or, you know, semi-clean, but when you step off, you may go like a foot or so, and it's like about maybe a foot deep or half a foot deep, and then all of a sudden you fall in to a huge snowbank because of the way the mountains lie. So, if she had, there was, it would be almost near impossible for her to walk off at that time of year into the woods because the snowbanks can get up to 10, 15 feet deep yeah. in some places. So, it would be almost near impossible. When the snow plows just pile it up yeah and, uh, and there but there were no footprints so she didn't go there and well, something else that is another flag was in the documentary and as well as james renner and a few of the detectives actually followed mar the route that mar would have taken and they left at the time she had left on the day she would have left so they would have had all the same stuff and Oddly enough, every single one of them arrived to the crash scene an hour earlier. So, therefore, there is an hour of discrepancy. Where was she that missing hour? I mean, there's speculation that she used some of that to stop off at the police station to pick up the records from the accident the night before to give to insurance. But that still leaves a considerable amount of time that's unknown. Did she stop somewhere? Did she bump into somebody who was being nefarious, like, ooh, yeah, you know, but then uh, the um, the the uh, card no the uh, the cell tower call. The, I'm gonna get to that. Yeah, I was gonna say. But you know, was she meeting somebody? It was like all these pieces and stuff, and there's like an hour missing. That many things could have happened in that hour that could explain what happened to her and why she may have cr why she crashed. Um, you know, there's the Bradley Hill Road, Row, which is the intersection, which is about 300 yards from, or feet, excuse me, from where the accident happened. It's right, you know, where a lot of people were, you know. Um, if you were a person, you know, if she was, you know, Butch would have seen if somebody came back to pick her up. You know, if somebody came back to pick her up, it would have been just a couple of seconds. She would jump in and say, hey, let's go. And they would have gone. But if someone had tried to take her, against her will, she is a West Point cadet. She knew how to take care of herself. She would have fought. She would have screamed and yelled, and it would have gotten the attention of not only Butch, but Faith and John Marriott. And, you know, it would have alerted that something wasn't right. Faith's house was, like, 50 feet from the crash. It was just this little corner, corner road. She's the corner house. It's She's right down there. It's not like it's up a hill and stuff. It, she's right there. She would have heard uh, that. Yeah. And also, you know, Butch would have seen, if somebody did pick her, Butch would have known. There was a, a, a report that was in a lot of police reports that Butch knew, saw what had happened tomorrow, knew what happened tomorrow, 
but was too terrified to say anything because he knew who did it. And a lot of times in these small communities, people know everybody, everybody knows everybody, everybody is related to everybody. And you know who it is you don't want to upset and who to be scared of, you know, <coughs> oh, they're the blunt blank cartel or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. And so, you know, Butch was not a tiny man. He was a pretty big man. So for him to be, to know somebody, to scare him enough to shut him up. Yeah. He's got to be a pretty tough guy, you know, and to the point where Butch ended up moving away from his home a few years later and moved down to Florida where he eventually died in 2009. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's to scare Butch. This guy, the guy or guys, his family have to be up to, to no good if that's in fact what you know, truly happened. And it's... And it's and, uh, and in his position, he has to live in that town with those people who are threatening him or turn away from this stranger who just came through town. And he has to, yeah, it's... Um, that's like the window of opportunity to kidnap her or to take her when she was there. It was like three to five minutes when yeah. somebody wasn't watching her. And it wasn't all at the same time, like maybe a minute here, a minute there. But total about, about three or five minutes. There wasn't a lot of opportunity for somebody to come and take her you know and butch was watching you know it was you know and the arrival of the police i mean it, there just wasn't enough time to account for it and john healy he was the investigator detective that took over after jeffrey and cecil uh passed on to them actually sat there on the corner and counted how many cars drove by at that time of night he counted eight and they mostly turned on that bill road uh and most of them were, were going home they lived there you know, mm. it was, it's just not, there's no cell service. It's very dark. There's nowhere, nothing for miles. It's rural area. You know, what was she doing there? What, I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest mysteries is why she was there. Um, you know, Healy also stated that he believes the stress in Mara's life built up. You know, what was, and she just wanted to get away and then met up with somebody nefari nefarious and mm -hmm. foul play happened, is what he believes. Um you know, as it is known, you know, Butch did give three different t stories, you know, slightly different, not hugely different, but enough to gather a little, gain a little bit of attention. But I think, again, that goes back to the theory of he probably knew who did it and was terrified and was trying to change the story up enough not to be able to implicate anybody. But he also passed the lie detector test. Yes, but he did. Yeah, he did. So, so like, how? You know, how do you... <laughs> how do you, how do you, you know, this is, this is this whole case is how, how does this happen? And why does yeah. this happen? It doesn't make sense. You know, the, there's just a lot of questions, you know, and Healy also stated that he didn't think the damage to Mara's car was, um, what people reported that there, it looked like that there was more damage, like she would have hit the back end of a semi truck earlier in that night. Um, but you know, this, when the truck was like stationary and she wasn't paying attention and like you know hitting a parked car so to speak mm. it's kind of what it looked like um you know and then trying to contact fred and trying to communicate with him was becoming volatile and it got to the point where when they started wanting to delve into her past fred's like nope no more and basically shut all cooperation and communication uh, between him his family and her friends and stuff anybody who would have had um Information. Information. He basically said, no, everyone be quiet. Don't talk about it. You don't need to know about Mara's past, blah, 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 blah. And it just, it became frustrating for the police because it's like, okay, we need to talk to them to, you know, figure out, to rule out people, to figure yeah. things out. And he didn't do that. And you know, he wouldn't let them do that. He couldn't rule, they, so that, therefore the police couldn't rule anything out. Uh, also... John Scarzina also um, joined the this case on Wednesday following her disappearance about 6 a.m. Uh, when her abandoned car was after her abandoned car was discovered and that they called him in and they realized after they realized it was a missing person he got involved in this and you know he even said okay this whole thing is hanky and weird it just doesn't fit too many unknowns too many things like they couldn't that was the. They, uh, he had talked to Fred. Fred finally was reached 
um, after the accident, and Fred made a comment that or statement that to me, if I was a police officer and I heard that if somebody whose daughter is missing makes this statement, I would be spec you know, kind of raising an eyebrow and putting a flag like, okay, why are you saying it? His statement, and I quote, uh, his first sense was that Mara had gone to the North Country to commit suicide, to go off and die like the old squaws did, is what Fred said. I'm like, you think your daughter went off into the woods to commit suicide? Are you joking? Are you serious? I mean, hello, this is your daughter you're talking about, and you're talking to the police, and your opening gambit is, oh, I think she committed suicide like the old squaws did back in, you know, old west time i'm like hello i mean it's just it's shocking to me as a behavioral analyst to we got a flag on the play there yeah red flag it's like what you know no this doesn't make sense it's you know it's when this head scratching things like i'm scratching my head because it's it's it's, you you, huh (laughs) why would you say that you know, that's when they also started that Wednesdays. They started all the searches. You know, they had dogs. They had helicopters. They had about 180 people on the ground. They did a 100-mile mm. circumference, um, a search party, trying to find where Mara may have, if she had wandered off. And it was a clear day. You no know, snow had happened. So they knew after that that she really, and they actually did another one that following summer uh, and didn't find anything. So they pretty much concluded that she did not walk off. Uh, into the woods and stuff because there were no human tracks there just wasn't and you know that's they could close that part out um again you know fred was cooperating to up to an, ex- to an extent and they started talking about the past and like no nope, we're not doing that anymore you know what's you know what's going on with her you know they would ask questions like what's going on with her life at, at, at umass you know and fred would say it's not important she's missing find her um, but I don't understand why she left. Maybe we could understand where she was going. If we understood why she left. Maybe that's why we knew her, her past. And Fred was like, no, it's not important. What's important is that she's gone. We need to find her now. But I'm like, in order to find her, we need to know her past. You know, it's everything goes and it's creating a timeline. And they couldn't do that. You know, and Fred would know Mara better than anybody else. She, he really would. I mean, he was there with her the day before she disappeared. Mm. You know, he knew what her mindset was. He was visiting with her. You know, they were bu- went to buy a car, apparently. You know, I mean, he was with her. So he should have known better than anybody else what was going on with Mara. And the fact he won't communicate and won't tell anybody about this is very speculative. It's very suspicious. It's very weird. It's not normal. It's blah. <laughs> so... You know, they were uh, partying, they came back for dinner, you know, she goes, comes back to the room at 3 a.m. or 3.30, whatever, and, you know, like, why did she leave her dorm? It was odd, you know, unless dad said something or she was afraid dad was going to say something if she didn't return the car. Yeah, supposedly she, well, supposedly she called him to tell him about the accident, and reportedly, I don't know where that, did that, did he say that? Yeah, he said that. He said that. That's right. He said that. And uh, it's, it's just, just you it's know, just weird. Yeah, you know, like there were reports, you know, that you know, like the three strikes out thing, and she passed out in her dorm, you know, in the the dorms in, yeah. in West Point and stuff. So, you know, clearly something was troubling her up. And all appearances, she had left on my name was leaving for good. Uh, she picked up her belongings. She, you know. Did everything she did to just disappear, and but she completed her homework. Mm-hmm. That's what she did. She did turn in an assignment. That was the other thing that was really weird. She turned in her all of her assignments and stuff. I'm like, if you're if I was gonna be disappearing and never coming back, why would I turn in my my school assignments? Mm. Yeah, it was just odd, you know. And like you know, Fred was kept on saying one of the theories is well, the police had something involved or were involved in it. They didn't do enough or they didn't do it in time, mm. you know. And that's one of the reasons why Fred's you know sued them. And he's just deflecting deflecting but you know they did admit that they should have been more alert to it instead of 36 hours later but again you know it looked like someone you know, but they made up. up for it once they started in yeah. they just went in all in well the detectives had completed 2938 records um and hope to use them and you know with future cases but also in the future of this case as well this included 254 source contacts 106 
interviews with witnesses and reports from 66 separate law enforcement officials, including detectives from Vermont, New York, and Maine. Uh, a grand jury was convened to issue subpoenas where uh, there were search warrants, background checks, credit card histories done. They also did four polygraph tests. They did one party intercept, which is in the ways known as a wiretap. You know, they were trying everything they could to find Mar and find out, despite Fred and his interferences, yeah. they were doing everything they could to, to find out what was going on. Um, one thing they can never figure out is what happened to that four thousand dollars that Fred had. You know, like I said, he said that he had put it into her bank account, but there was no record of that. And there was no record yeah. of what happened to it after he withdrew it. Yeah, he said he said he put it in the account in case she was out there somewhere and would check it and, and draw it out and then they can check where where that happened. And so that's why he put it in there. But no record of mm-hmm. that. You know, both Healy and Scarzina both had said, you know, said that Fred had refused to sit down for a formal interview yeah. until two and a half years later, after she had disappeared, as he finally sat down. And the handwritten report that he did, you know, it was 29 lines, and it took to the 25th line to even mention that she was missing. And all the discrepancies that he had in there, everything else was in there. It was just like, okay, there was more about him than it was about his da- missing daughter, which was very... Uh, revealing they actually had a gentleman by the name of Hyatt. He was a handwriting specialist that came in and was actually looking at that and said, this is somebody who's being deceptive. You know, it was very telling his uh, his report. You know, people blamed the boyfriend because the boyfriend was controlling and strict and wanted to know everywhere she was, when she was, who she yeah. was with, all that kind of stuff. And that she was running from him and ended up with somebody not... Uh, not a good person to be, mm. to be around. Um, you know, they were talking about the crime scene itself. This is actually a direct quote from Healy, John Healy. He's like, everything about the scene of the accident was weird. If she had just, if, <clears throat> if she had just lost control of the car coming around the corner, she would have impacted the side of the curb. She didn't. What really happened was she t- clipped the corner of the of the on her left and sheared the snowbank clean off and continued on to the other side where she turned the car around. To me, I'd say her car stalled out and she was trying to regain control as she was coming into the turn. Which would fit with another thing that was weird in this case was there was a rag in her tailpipe. And her dad, what did her dad say about it? He's, uh, he took, he, when asked about if he knew anything about that, he said, oh, I told her to do that because her car was so bad and it was, it, it had, uh, issues but he was smoking a lot so he said if she stuck that in there to uh, partially in there that it might mask the smoke so that she might not get stopped for that car um uh, he didn't he didn't say to do it for this trip because he did not know about the trip but if the car if it if the rag was in there and depending on what material it was that it would um uh, absorb the moisture from in the thing and the heat and it could uh, swell up and choke the air and uh, cause the car it's to uh, stall, which it could have been just by chance it was that location. It's also possible that she's not the one that put it in there, that if somebody, if she'd stopped somewhere for gas or get a bite to eat or something and somebody saw her and decided to follow her and the did that. Opportunity. To, yeah, the other opportunity stick that in there, and then hopefully she, you know, just follow her far enough about, and that she would end up alongside the road somewhere, and they could rescue her, you know. But the car would have been seen, so. Car, yeah, so that didn't happen, so either. Yeah, because if you look at the know. thing here, when you're driving down a road and going into a 90 degree angle to the left, and you hit ice, you're going to automatically swerve a car into the turn. Mm-hmm. She didn't do that. She swerved the opposite direction to the right, and her car was backed facing the way she'd come, which yeah. is impossible to do on that kind of road without the car stalling. Because it looked like the car stalled out. She was trying to regain control and it spun the opposite direction. But the headlights spinning around like that because she turned, that would definitely attract attention in that nearby house. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because those... Which was what Faith Westman said that, you know, she had heard the crashing at 7.27 p.m. You know, she was peeking out the door. She saw Miranda's car... Or, Mara's car out there, 
And I was just, you know, paying attention and called the police and stuff. You know, John Marriott said, I saw her get out of the car, walk around and stuff like that. And then he went away, then came back and the police were there and she was gone. Um, so, you know, there's people who saw it. And then, of course, Butch, you know, sitting there in his driveway and everything. There's a lot of uh, speculation. Um, one of the biggest theories and one that is becoming harder and harder to disprove is the tandem driver theory. And that is one that the police and James Renner and the documentary kind of really try to to say, oh, it didn't happen, but could never... Couldn't disprove it. Just, just couldn't disprove it. And what that is, is that she could have been... Sense. Yeah, it makes sense. She could have been traveling in tandem with another car. She, she had been following them, and that would explain how she got past that windy-ass road to get onto 112 to where... Yeah, because it... If she wasn't familiar with it, it would be easy to miss, especially mm -hmm. at night. Yes. But we'd be leading the way, and after the accident, the second car turned around and picked her up, and it would have just been a couple of seconds for her to jump into that car and say, okay, let's go, let's go, let's move, let's move. You know, and, you know, that would explain why nobody saw it, because it happened so quickly, and there was those moments, like I said, mm -hmm. where people weren't looking all the time, you know. Yeah, if the lead car had gone by and... Mm -hmm. Nobody would have noticed because it's just a car going by. Then she spun out and it caused all the commotion, is, and they'd forgotten all about that car. And but the car went around the corner and realized, oh, she's not in my rearview mirror anymore. I got to go back, and just that, just enough time for them not to notice that and then come back and pick her up. They could have picked her up. She jumped in. Let's go. And then they left. You know, the tandem driver theory explains a lot of stuff, almost everything. But the, but the biggest question is, if it was a tandem driver that was there that night, who? who was the tandem driver? Was it her sister, one of her sisters? Was it her dad, because Fred did have a rental car? Was it, you know, it couldn't have been Billy, because Billy, we know, was flying back from New Hampshire is when he got a mysterious phone call. Uh, she would used a, a, a pay card. This was after she had disappeared. She used her... Uh, phone card to call Billy and she had heard whimpering and uh, someone cold or something like that and it was while he was going through security so he actually missed the voicemail but he tried to call it back and he found out that it was the phone card that he she was using um but yeah I mean who was in that car you know she yeah. had a friend David Whalen who lives in Quebec who was a professional poker player you know people speculate that she was going up there to meet him to run away and disappear which is a highly, which is highly possible because um, at the other end of 112 is 93, which goes north to Quebec. Yes. So, um, you know, late in that same afternoon, um, she is traveling there. It was probably like an, maybe two hours or so before she had crashed, she received a phone call from an, you know, an outgoing phone call. It was made to her phone from the London Dairy New Hampshire Sprint Tower. Uh, the call had to be made within a 22-mile radius of that tower when they called her. Um, they have, The police have not released the name or phone number mm -hmm. of the individual who contacted her, but it seems highly likely to me that whoever was calling her was setting up the meeting location and the rest of the plan as if she was running away. Like, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. Meet me here. That would yeah. probably maybe explain that missing hour that's there. Um, met up with somebody maybe he, she thought she trusted maybe it was somebody she met online maybe it was her friend David you know David has made some nefarious comments as well over time you know that were you know if I'm implicated well maybe I should be you know just certain weird statements as maybe he might have done it who knows I mean just and you know sometimes these can be just offhand comments you know just out of sarcasm but um, you know she got that phone call who was it? We don't know. What was it about? We don't know. But we just know that she did get one. And, you know, something else that was really odd was her assistant coach, Hosen, Hosen, um, you know, I heard a lot of time, heard a lot about her mom, uh, but never heard about her dad. And for, you know, outside looking in, they had apparently, her and her dad had a very tight relationship. So why didn't her, people who were the closest to her track team and friends, not know that, with the exception of Kate and Sarah, not know that her dad was alive. They had heard all about her mom, but nothing about her dad, which to me seems really odd for somebody who's very close to a parent, 
in a good way, you'd want to talk about your dad. And especially being an assistant coach, you would have heard about her dad. Her dad is your trainer at home. Exactly. But he never heard anything about her dad. And he always assumed that maybe dad was out of the picture and died or something. So he never brought it up because he never heard about it. So mm -hmm. when he, after she disappeared and he found out that Fred was alive, it kind of shocked him a little bit. He actually told the police that he's like, I didn't. She never talked about him. Which the police have scratched their heads about a little bit. And they're like, okay, they were supposed to be really close. Why didn't they? Why Why didn't yeah. she? You know. So that's out there. Um, you know, then they went into another theory, the murder theory. There was a gentleman that came, a man that came forward named Larry. Um, and his brother Claude. It was Larry and Claude uh, Moulton. Larry had found a bloody knife and a bloody piece of carpet and had turned it over to Fred, who turned it then to the police. Uh, they never heard anything back, which is not unheard of. You know, they try to keep things back. But they, it was from an A-frame home house that was within a mile from where Mara disappeared. And dogs hit on the blood trail in the, in the closet. They did run the DNA. You actually see part of it. And some wood shavings from John Smith, who was a retired cop that has dealt with the anniversary and has dealt with this case a lot. Um, that's in the sixth part. That's in the yeah. sixth part yeah. thing. But you actually see them run it for DNA, and they did get two hits back, a male and another one. They couldn't determine if it was male or female, but they said that it, it was enough that if you compared it to Mara, you might have the answer. You know, you might, this might be Mara. But they never, whether or not they did that, we don't know. Um, but, you know, it's a big possibility that could be happening if she was picked up or, you know, she ended up down at that A-frame house. Who yeah. knows? Um, we don't know. Uh, one thing that uh, also, going back to the handwriting expert, you know, he, he got, he sent all the information about Fred over to a psychologist named um, Philpin. Excuse me. And because he was like, I, a lot of times in cases when they're trying to get some extra tips, they go to behavior analysts, psychologists. Maybe there's a different uh, way of looking at a crime scene to get some more ideas of what may have happened. And so they sent it to the psychologist. And the psychologist said that, that the keys to finding Mara would be looking at her past. Um, but it's really hard to get an understanding of her past because Fred has blocked everything about her past mm -hmm. from being let out. From like her telling her friends not to disclose anything to her boyfriend. I mean, everybody's been tight-lipped, not talking. So it's been very difficult. Uh, the psychologist did go on to say that the dad uh, was... Uh, the dad has info that he isn't sharing. Like, you know, he's got to know something. There's just... He was too close. Um, that he said, I never believed Fred. Not one, uh, not one word. There is something very wrong about that man. He created so many smoke screens that nobody could really get a, ha a handle on him. Fred wanted total control of Mara's life, and that was unnatural, and had an unnatural and unusual closeness between father and daughter, which, you know, to me, is was odd in itself. I mean, I had a very close relationship with my father. May he rest in peace. But uh, not like that, where they would, you know, she's 15, 16, 17 years old, and they'd go camping, and they'd share a tent in the hotel room. I mean, just... Well, it might have been two beds. It might have been two beds, but, you know. But sharing, know, a, home, but sharing a hotel, hotel room like that. It was just odd behavior for a father and a daughter. Um, you know, yes, I've shared hotel rooms with my dad, but usually my mother was there or somebody else yeah. was there. But sharing a single one with just me and my dad, uh, no, that would have never happened. Um, but, yeah, so the psychologist even said that something wasn't right with, with Fred. <laughs> um, big surprise. But, um, you know, they're like, oh, well, her worries were, you know, she was, you know, worries what caused her to run away, which is a possibility. Uh, she did have a lot that was on her plate and stuff. Mm. Um, one other big thing about Fred, there was a grocery store called Butson's that was right down the road. And they swear that they saw Mara and two other ladies or two other people with her uh, buying liquor right before the accident. And... You know, they checked the IDs. Two were from Massachusetts. One was from um, New, New York. York. And when Fred Murray got wind of this, he demand he made a big, big, big to do, a big scene. He wanted that security footage before the police got it, and was demanding it. 
<coughs> which is very odd because I'm like, why are you so demanding of something that should be going rightfully to the police if they're in... Unfortunately, the store did not have security footage. But, uh, you know, for him to demand something like that was just extremely odd because you'd want the police to have it to be able to look at it, to yeah. see somebody following them, who was she with, who do we... You know, it was like as if she he was wanting to see something, make sure that whatever it was wasn't in that video that he was trying to hide. It's what it, it comes across, you know, and it's just the fact that he just blew up like that was insane um you know and again there was like david whalen and you know, he was there but uh one of the other theories that i had there was one that was actually matched verbatim in james book was the underground railroad uh up there in, it's, there are a lot of them across the country and there's it's not like the underground railroad from way back when this is it's a similar concept but it deals with getting uh, people who are in abusive situations, domestic violence, things like that, getting them out of where they are, going from like, it connects people to people to people to people along a certain route to get them from point A to point B, wherever they're going, safely and without people acknowledging. And, you know, because it's such a rural area, because everybody has been so tight-lipped in, in the neighborhood where she crashed, and because the crash does kind of look staged a little bit, it's you know, plausible that it could have been the Underground Railroad and Butch and Faith and uh, John Marriott may have had something to do with it. It's highly possible. Or, um, or aware of it to help it along and keep it. Exactly. You know, so it's it entirely, on. entirely possible. Um, again, you know, these are all speculations and theories that are out there. They're very plausible. You know, the police had actually come up with five different Theories. One was the police that were involved in it somehow. Suicide. Uh, she got lost in the woods somewhere. She ran away on purpose or she disappeared or was murdered. Well, we could rule out the suicide. She did not commit suicide because we would have found a body. She didn't wander out into the woods because there were no footprints or anything like that anywhere. And the police, yes, while they do admit that they should have started and acted sooner, they didn't. Um, they're just, you know, they, but. They made up for they it. They made up for it and everything they've done. And they've really, really shown and made an effort of trying to solve this despite Fred's interference. And, you know, with Fred, a lot of times in crime, you know, the person who's directly involved or responsible for the disappearance or the crime at hand will try to intervene or try to inject themselves into the, the case themselves and a lot of times it's to find out how words police know or try to you know muddle up things to hide things and, and whatnot so that you know it, based on what fred was doing that could have been who knows but uh you know we have that theory there's so many theories out there and you know the police are trying to track each one down and you know having the interference with fred it's just been you know, <laughs> it's been difficult and very, very hard for anybody to to get mm. ahead in this thing. So, again, I, I implore any of you, if anybody has any tips or or, or clues or has, was there at that party or was there um, at the time she was or on that route at the time she was and, she, and you saw her or her car, please let the authorities know. Please call the number down below. You know, let them know. And you can do it, again, you can do it anonymously. You know, like I said, this case has been out there. It's the 20th anniversary is coming up next month on May, February 9th, mm -hmm. uh, 2024. You know, hopefully we can bring some closure to this family. There's been searches. The police continue to investigate. It is an open investigation, and they're accepting all kinds of tips and questions and, and whatnot. So please, please call if you know anything. And Mara, if you do, if you are alive and you are safe and sound, it's wonderful. But please get a message to your family. And to the rest of the world, so we know that you're okay. Her sisters have said it's they would be fine if they if she's got a new life somewhere, but they'd like to know, and they you know they would be happy that she would be safe. Yeah. But if she if they could just know that and have closure, yeah. And I mean, it also leads to note that uh, Heather Roush, which is Billy's sister. Uh, had wanted to come forward and say something about to the police about something illegal that Mara did or something it was involved in, but was unable to come forward because she ended up committing suicide shortly before she had planned to come forward. So 
that leaves a, a question in there too. So like I said, there are a lot of questions and a lot of theories about this case. And you can go on and on and on and talk for hours on and on end about this case and the theories that people have come up with, you know, but I implore you to watch the, the documentaries and to read the book and to, to really delve into it. And if you know anything, please call. Um, but that is all we have on Mara. You know, it's her, her story, her, her, uh, her, her timeline and the strangeness of it and all that so but uh, and this will be you know the first of hopefully many 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 stories that we do our next story will be about amber hagerman it's the girl that was behind the amber alert it's her story her anniversary for her disappearance is coming up uh it will also she disappeared i believe it was in the early early to mid 90s mm. Um, and she created, her mother helped create, uh, the Amber Alert. She's like, we need some kind of an alert to, to alert us when a child goes missing. And so in the process of doing that and contacting radio stations, she created the Amber Alert. But that is a story for our next broadcast. Um, we hope that you'll tune in. Please like, subscribe, and comment. If you have any other cases or cold cases that you know of that you find interesting, you know, want us to take a look at, want us to review and tell, please send it, put us in the comments, like it. You know, again, like, subscribe, like, subscribe, click on the little bell, you know, and put the stuff into the, the comments of what you want us to look at, and we'll be happy to, to look at anything that you yeah, we've give got to a loose, us. a loose list right now, but if you've got something that we're not even aware of, that would be, uh, that is really interesting or means something. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many cases out there that sometimes it's hard to find them. So I asked, hey, give me some cases and yeah. give me some names to look into, and I'd be happy to look at them. And uh, But that is all we have for you today. I hope you enjoyed uh, hearing about Mara. I hope that you know we reach out to somebody who may have an answer for her family and hopefully maybe bring her home in one way or another. Um, so I hope that you all stay safe out there. Please be observant of your surroundings and those around you. And, you know, stay safe. And until the next time, this is Juliana and Barb signing off. And we'll see you next time. Take care.